Who do you love? Mm. Cody and I discussed the Houston Texans head coach candidates now that they need that position field. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to a Wednesday episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. That's what promo code locked on. Again, that's promo code locked on. And I am John Hickman, and this is Cody Davis here to discuss the Houston Texans. As, as of right now, they have, excuse me, the Houston Texans have six head coaches lined up for the, well, six candidates lined up for their vacancy at the head coaching position, Jonathan Gannon, Ben Johnson, D'Amico Ryans, Evero, the defensive coordinator uh, from the Broncos, Shane Steichen. And now the sixth candidate is Mike Kafka, the offensive coordinator for the New York Giants, who I think did a phenomenal job with the weapons or lack thereof mm. uh, in New York this year and helped lead that team to the playoffs with Brian Daybo, who was also the hottest name in the head coaching circuit last year, went to New York, did a complete 180 helping that team, and along with not only helping that team out, bringing over Wink Martindale, but did a phenomenal job with helping Daniel Jones. Cody, I know that was a name, and Mike Kafka, when we were going through our pre pregame in terms of the show that you really liked, and now Houston has him on their radar, uh, he's officially been requested by the Texans. That's your guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to say that's my number one choice. I mean, my number one choice, if I'm being honest, is D'Amico Ryans. But I, I still don't know if he's going to accept the request. Still don't know if that's a and real I possibility. And I hope he doesn't either because, you know, this franchise, even though on Monday things finally looked like for the second year in a row that it was looking like it was going in a positive direction – it's still a lot going on, and whenever D'Amico Ryans get his opportunity, his first head coaching opportunity, I want him to be in a better situation. And by the way, he's one of my all-time favorite Texans. So, But in terms of Mike, John, when you take a look at the turnaround that the New York Giants did this season, I mean, you're talking about a team that was just like the Houston Texans at the bottom of the league for an extremely long time, and now they are a playoff caliber team. I believe this week is going to mark the first time they was in the playoffs since, what, 2016, 2017? I believe that was um, Odell Beckham's last year in New York, if I'm not mistaken. That was the last playoff team that the New York Giants had. However, <clears throat> I understand Brian Deball. He deserves it. Coach of the year candidate, in my opinion. But you cannot take away what Mike also did for that team. And when you compare what the Giants were last year to where they were this year, you can see a complete 180. You look at the points per game. This year, they averaged 21 and a half points. Last year, it was 15 and a half. Touchdowns. This year, they scored 40. Last year, 24. In terms of first down, you're talking about a team like we've been saying over the last two seasons. We want to see the Houston Texans move the chains. This year, they completed 352 first downs last year 290 you got to give Mike some respect plus I do believe that he did more with less because when you take a look at that New York Giants roster I mean yes you have Saquon Barkley and yes he was healthy and I do understand that a healthy Saquon Barkley has played a big factor into why the New York Giants were a playoff team this year but just take a look at he was what he was able to do. I mean, he was he had an opportunity to fix Daniel Jones. You're talking about a guy that was damn near broken before he got there. Now there, there are reports that the New York Giants want to extend him to a long-term contract. And when you take a look at his at the Giants wide receiving core, 
No disrespect to Darius Slade, no disrespect to Richie James, but none of those receivers eclipse over 1,000 receiving yards. So when you take a look at what you want out of a coach, a coach that is going to utilize the hand that he is dealt, <laughs> Mike has to be one of, if not the top candidate for this organization as of right now. One thing I like about Mike, uh, exactly what you said, Darius Slayton didn't really pan out as much as the New York Giants would have liked for him to do so. And then when we look at one of the biggest disappointments in free agent history, <laughs> uh, Kenny Galladay, he only had 81 yards this year, one touchdown. That touchdown came in the last game of the year. Um, he was playing with the backups and didn't have an opportunity throughout the year, whether that was staying healthy or just – make the most of his opportunities to really contribute to this team. Uh, Richie James, Hodgins, uh, Bellinger at tight end. These were the top options for this offense in terms of skill position players. And I could look at Richie James and I could look at Hodgins and I could look at Bellinger and say, well, well, let's look at Chris Moore. Let's look at, you know, Jordan Akins and let's look at the lackluster talent that Houston has right now. Hmm. Um, and then also remember they moved on from Kadarius Tony at the beginning of the year, so they didn't have that to work with with that offense. I like that option of Kafka. Uh, Kafka is one of those guys that I need to take time and really go look and see how his offense operated. Uh, but why I really like it for Houston is because yeah, Kafka is 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 a, is a, is a candidate that makes sense. I don't think that they've so far requested any candidate that does not make sense. And that's all you can really ask for your franchise right now. Not necessarily saying that, you know, he'll hit on these candidates. We look at Cal McNair and Nick Casario or how long he's going to be here. But Kafka makes sense, man. And, you know, overall, helping along with Brian Debo get the most out of a Daniel Jones. That was Im impressive. So mm -hmm. I like for Houston. I like that Houston is, you know, going after – uh, requesting Mike Kafka. Uh, once that happens, you know, we'll let you guys know how we feel and, and bring more information to the table, especially getting some time to look at his offense and how he was schematically helping that team win games. So uh, good move, good decision for Houston. I do want to mention this before moving on, and this is another reason why I'm high on Mike. Um, when he became the offensive coordinator for the New York Giants last year, he got a big endorsement from Patrick Mahomes and Patrick Mahomes gave him credit of as one of the coaches early, early on in his career playing in Kansas city as yeah. one of the coaches that helped him be the player that he is. And I think right now it doesn't matter if it's Bryce, it doesn't matter if it's CJ, you want a coach that is used to taking a raw quarterback prospect and helping him reach his potential. And in Patrick Mahomes case kind of surpass it in this league. I know this is playoff season, and thank God it's no longer college football season, but it's also taxes season. So what I'm telling you guys is come on over to TurboTax and don't do your taxes. Allow TurboTax, who has the experts that can help relieve you from the stresses of taxes and file for you so you can do not your taxes. Don't do your taxes. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. And I'm also really geeked out about our new partner and sponsor of today's show, the mobile game Ultimate Football GM. If you've ever dreamed about becoming an NFL GM and managing your own football franchise, well, your dream can finally come true. And this game is definitely for you. Hire the right coaches and coordinators. Trade your players. Make draft picks. Navigate your franchise through free agency and the draft and all of the ups and downs of a season. All of this in a challenging yet realistic game Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want, when you want to. Our Locked On Texan and listeners can get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On in all caps. Check it out in the game store under Ultimate Football GM and make sure that you use the promo code Locked On in all caps. Visit uh, I'm sorry, visit ultimate-gm.com today. Ultimate Football GM, start your fantasy now. Welcome back in, Locked On Texans listeners and viewers out there in the Texan world. Man, it's, it's, it's been crazy today. A lot of turmoil, a lot of <laughs> arguing, a lot of back and forth, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of blaming, a lot of trying to figure out who's the next coach going to be, a lot of figuring out 
who is the next franchise quarter quarterback going to be. And I've even still seen people holding on to Davis Mills hope. <laughs> Let me tell you something, guys. <laughs> I don't see that happening. Mm. But break my heart like that. what I think makes sense for the Houston Texans, and this is my full endorsement as of right now for the Lions offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson. Listen, he started in the NFL in Miami from 2012 to 2018, started as an offensive assistant in 2015, named the team's tight end coach with the Miami Dolphins. And from 2016 to 2018, he was the team's wide receiver coach. Then moves on over, follows <clears> – <throat> You know, it gets to Detroit, starts at the team, starts as the team quality coach, 2020 to 2021, was the team side end coach, and 2022 finally named as the team's offensive coordinator. What do I like about his coaching history in Miami? Johnson spent the offseason in the first four games of the 2015 season assisting with the quarterback position and helped develop who? Ryan Tannehill. Ryan mm. Tannehill passed for over 4,200 passing yards that year and steadily approved <clears throat> in passing yards in all four of his seasons under Ben Johnson's coaching. Put a pin in that quarterback spot I'm talking about right now. What did I learn and like from his coaching time so far up until right now in Detroit? Well, before Dan Campbell took over play calling from Anthony Lynn after week nine in 2021, that bye week, Johnson had a bigger role in coordinating the passing attack. Why is this important? Well, Jared Goff had a touchdown to interception ratio of eight to six and a passer mm. rating just over 85 <laughs> in his first eight starts with Detroit. The Lions were winless. Over his last six starts after the change and allowing Ben Johnson to take over that passing attack, Jared Goff's ratio improved to 11 to two with a passer rating over 100. Detroit finished 3-2-1 and one in that stretch. Some of the things that his former players have said about him, and I say former players because he will be a head coach, he will mm -hmm. leave Detroit. Uh, in, two, in a 2022 interview, rookie wide receiver Amon St. Brown praised his attention to detail when installing the red zone plays. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. <laughs> the Texans were ranked 27th in the NFL in team red zone scoring percentages with touchdowns this past season. Offensively, Detroit ranked fourth in the league. That is a huge sign this guy signed. If God was, you know, to come down with a sign, 27 compared to fourth is one of them. St. Brown also ended his rookie season with 460 yards and five touchdowns in the final six games. At that point during the season, remember, he had Johnson had an increased role with the team offensively. St. Brown caught 63 of Detroit's rookie record, 90 passes, while Johnson had the offensive game plan under control. And what's he, what he always does, and when we look at uh, Armand St. Brown, he credits the analytically savvy coach with a lot of success late in that season. Remember, not only did it help out the quarterback in Jared Goff, but it also helped out the rookie first time playing NFL game wide receiver. Put a pin in that. Why is that important? I'll bring it back. And if we are looking for Ben Johnson to affect the future, that's pleasant for what wide receiver that will finally play football for the Houston Texans next year? John Mitchell. Mm, let's keep it going. <laughs> I also want to cite the good things he's done for players like Kenny Stills, like a DJ Chalk, who was almost left for dead in Jacksonville after his, after his injury, but specifically for undrafted wide receiver Khalif Raymond, who got season highs this year, 616 receiving yards. TJ Hawkinson, the tight end, I'm going to bring it back, so just stay with me, said that Johnson's coaching style resonates with the players because it's an all-inclusive style. All-inclusive. Work together. Together. Why is that important? Well, what did we just hear about? Lovey Smith not taking in the advice from not only the players, but the coaching staff. And what has, what was our takeaway from Nick Casera's press conference? It ain't I. <laughs> it's we. It's we. <laughs> all-inclusive. 
and the <clears throat> players feel like they get an opportunity to get some ownership and say so on how the play calling is ultimately looks and Hawkinson credits Johnson for helping him become a pro bowl player. Hawkinson was a pro bowler in 2020 catching 67 patches, passes 723 yards and six touchdowns. My final thoughts about Ben Johnson while I'm going full endorsement on him right now on this show. And I think that he should be the future head coach for the Houston Texans. I like Ben Johnson because he has a proven track record to improve players on the side of the ball that's been beyond underwhelming for the past two seasons for the Houston Texans and for some positions beyond that quarterback wide receiver tight end the beauty of it all he's going to get his pick at the quarterback position in this upcoming draft and I and I'll, I'll even say this guys um I think Houston has some players on a roster right now that Johnson would have an immediate impact on John Mechie, Tegan Quatoriano, tight end, Nico Collins, uh, Amari Rogers, Brevin Jordan. And I love the usage of Jamal Williams and DeAndre Swift. So I am pretty positive about how he'd be able to bring in a second running back to help take some of that pressure off of our rookie running back here in Houston and allow that offense to be effective. He helped Tannehill in Miami with a, a well and with a rookie quarterback. And I even like him for the idea of helping Davis Mills become a better pro quarterback as well. I think if you mm. bring him here to Houston with the capital that you have, with the draft capital and, and, and the cap space in the offseason, this is a quarterback, not a quarterback, this is a head coach, potential head coach that can take your team over the hump. He has done a phenomenal job with growing some of the quarterback, the quarterbacks, uh, the tight ends, the wide receivers, getting the potential out of these guys in order to make them a better franchise. We were talking about the Detroit Lions and the Miami Dolphins. Damn, John, you kind of make me want to change my top candidacy right now. Um, the one thing that I like about both Johnson and Mike, both of these guys, you can actually see a track record of their coaching attributes. And what I mean by that is this is not – candidates these are not candidates who are attached to a great name already perfect example bill o'brien everybody thought bill o'brien was this quarterback whisperer and, and he was going to be the next phenomenal well, head Cap coach is a, he is attached to andy reed yeah he's attached to andy reed but look what he was able to do in new york what i mean by this is we're we're not talking about mike as somebody who is 100% coming out of Kansas City. No, he spent a year in right. New York, and we saw what he was able to do with Daniel freaking Jones. This is not like a couple years ago when the Texans hired Bill O'Brien, and everybody was like, oh, he's this quarterback whisperer. Oh, see, he's going to be the next great head coach. But yet, he was coaching Tom Brady, and he was coaching under Bill Belichick. And I think anybody can work with those two, and you're going to look better than expected. In terms of Big Johnson, you could say the same thing. John, I wrote a couple stats down, just like I did for Mike. I'm going to do it for Ben. Um, this year, the, the Detroit Lions averaged 26 and a half points. Last year, 19. Um, this past season, they recorded 54 touchdowns. Last year, 35. This year, 376 first downs last year, 320. You have to give both of these candidates their respect because I do not believe that neither one of these teams will make the complete 180 that they did without neither one of these guys. And I also want to say this, one of, if not the biggest issue with this offense, because I like what we have on defense. I like Singley. I like Christian Harris. I like Jalen Petrie. Uh, I like uh, Jay Hansen. I like I like some of the pieces that Houston has right now. The biggest issue has been the lack of being able to put points on the board, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we look at and, that, and, and that's know, why I wanted to make those comparison of what they was able to do offensively, right? But when we look at Houston, the finger has pointed for the past let's go fourteen games out of seventeen directly to Pep Hamilton and his mm -hmm. you know vanilla play calling or the <laughs> lack of trust in his guys, just play calling in general. What I like about Ben Johnson is, listen, he disguises plays by using some of the same looks. And so he may give you a look early in a drive, right? You know, see, uh, a, 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 I said two tight ends set, may motion the guy out. But this time, on the first time you see it, motion your tight end out, but he's going to get the ball to his running back, right? The next time you see that front, same front, same set, two tight ends set, 
motion the tight end. But this time, on a, on a third and short, where you want to kind of catch the defense off, off guard on second and short, this time, instead of running it, you run it to that same way with your motion guy, but then you also have somebody leak out. Or you may have a like a, a pick play and somebody can just get, I just like the way he designs plays. I like the way he disguises it. And I like how much he brings a modern feel to the game. And I'll tell you what, man, when we look at Jared Goff, who is in running, I think Geno Smith wraps it up, but Jared Goff is in, in running for a uh, comeback player of the year. He was left for dead in Detroit, right? Traded for Matthew Stafford, a player that Sean McVay felt like he had got to where he can get to. And I can't move on any further. Did Jared Goff play so well this year that nobody is picking Detroit to get a quarterback in the first round compared to hmm. when the season started last year. It was oh, Detroit yeah. should get they a quarterback. They was in the running for number one. Number one, Bryce Young. He said they should go with one of these guys. Now you're looking at this team by saying, well, they won eight games and Jared Goff threw for over 4,000 yards. And, and I'm sorry is, to cut you off. Go ahead. But – the New York Giants was damn near in that same situation. As to the beginning of the year, they were looked at as a team that was going to be in the running for C.J. or Bryce. Now they're looking at Daniel Jones as a guy that they might be committed to him long term. This franchise, they do got some talented offensive players. Uh, Mechie's coming back. That's my biggest comparison. Like when, what he did for Amon St. Brown when he got the passing, became the passing game coordinator, I look at that and say, well, in his first year, let's allow somebody with an offensive mind that can make his transition to the NFL level easier. And I think that's Ben Jones, Ben Johnson. Either way, one of these coaches is going to make a lot of money this offseason from a franchise. By the way, the Houston Texans are paying roughly, I think, nearly $40 million to between David Culley and now Lovey Smith. Uh, I just wish I had that position to say, you know what, that forty million really ain't gonna hurt me right now. Mm, but mm, mm. you know what can help you is that's going ahead and checking out Prize Picks. Prize Picks is super easy. Pick two to five players if they score more or if they score less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to ten times your money. Super easy. So let's just say Kevin Porter Jr has a over-under on 19 and a half points. If you pick over and he scores 20, you just help your, your prize pick projection win some money. If he scores under and you pick over, well, you probably don't win nothing unless you do the flex play, which allows you to make some extra cash. Even if you don't win on all of them, it helps you out in the long run. You still get some money in the long run, excuse me. First time users can receive a 100% Instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars with promo code locked on. So check out prospects.com promo code locked on. Welcome back in locked on Texans listeners and viewers out there. Before we get out of here today, Josina Anderson had an interesting tweet, and that tweet read: "I'm told there's still uncertainty surrounding the current front office situation with the Houston Texans." To put it respectfully, per league source. While the current structure assists ownership in navigating this offseason for the time being, it is tenuous at best. We will see. So for me, it sounds like Cal will be predominantly running this coaching search. <laughs> uh, and if the guy that he likes doesn't necessarily like Nick Casario or isn't on the same terms of that vision, then Nick Casario is out of it, which explains <clears throat> Nick saying multiple times during that press conference on Monday that basically I could be out of here too as well. <laughs> um, and and I, I do want to say this to that point. If that's the case, why not move on now? I, I think that Nick shouldn't have a saving grace because – it makes sense to make sure your general manager is on the same page with your head coach, especially if you're looking at a head coach general manager that's going to be in this building for the first time. I don't like this decision. If you're not 100% sold on him and confident in him from a, from the uh, ownership standpoint and that brass, then move on from him now. I think that's kind of cowardly and, and, and taking the backseat to what you should be doing. He deserves no saving grace for the job that he's done so far. I wouldn't go that far as to say – he doesn't deserve a saving grace because, and we, we just talked about this like a couple of days ago. I think it's early as last week. Um, 
even though, mate, even though Nick Casario botched two head coaching searches, and I've been very critical of him in terms of the type of talent that he has built this roster with, he has still done some really good things. I mean, we talk about it here a lot on the show. You you can't take away what he has done through the draft. Um, but then, of course, how he was able to still get not full price value, but damn near close to near full price value for Deshaun Watson. So I could kind of understand stand why Kyle McNair is willing to work with him for at least one more year because it's like, okay, if you can finally get the right head coach and finally bring some talent to this team, I truly do believe that Nick Casario has the potential to be at least a decent general manager or a pretty solid, pretty good general manager in this league. I mean, because he has shown time and time again that there are moments where he knows what he is doing, like he understands it. However, there are also times where his arrogance, I believe, probably got in the way. And especially you also got to consider the fact that he did come into the situation that was pretty messed up that I don't really think Harley, no general manager would be successful as of right now. However, you still can't deny the fact that he has fired not one, but two head coaches. And this is going to be his third year. And we're about to go into head coach search number three, even though I would like to give him a pass for David Cully. Um, you still can't deny the facts, man. Make sure you guys check us out throughout the week as we continue to cover your Houston Texans every day. I'm <laughs> not, not hours, <laughs> not not hours. You know, it's your hours. team every day, <laughs> and our can't be yours, and yours can't be ours. Right there, right. But uh, make sure you check us out throughout the week. If you are new to the show, do us a favor. Go ahead and subscribe, like, but above all, comment as well. Let us know your thoughts about this situation follow us on twitter at locked on texans and uh let's get the ball rolling on this offseason man and as always i'm your host cody m davis please remember to follow me on twitter at cody davis underscore 24 once again that's cody seal t-y-d-a-v-i-s underscore 24 until next time ladies and gentlemen peace